The title of today's message is Power On, and I brought my uh, cell phone out here, which is dead as a doornail, and as it turns out, without any power, uh, I guess you could hammer nails, I don't know what, it should be a paperweight, Uh, without power, no matter how much it costs, it's worthless. Uh, It does nothing. It, it, It can help you in no way. Now, there's a simple little button on my phone on the side. And if I push that and hold that, and this goes like it's supposed to go, little fruit comes up on the front, which is so fascinating. Everybody thinks that little apple with the bite out of it has something to do with the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, this is way aside, but you say, oh, that was the fruit that Adam ate. There's nothing in the Bible about Adam and Eve and apples. Not in there, so if you think these are cursed for that reason, then that's not the reason. So, what is happening to that phone? It's, it's powering on. It's coming on. Um, now, I think if you've survived a weather event of any kind, anywhere, you have a category possibly for power being on and power being off. Uh, Rebecca and uh, I had the experience of being at our home for 50 hours straight with power off. And I did not know what a nightcap was until that experience. Uh, A nightcap is something you wear because you can't sleep completely under the covers. And when it's 50 degrees in your house, once you get in bed, I will say this. Once you're under those sheets, if you can breathe your own air for a while, it gets pretty toasty. But the top of your head, the pillow, everything gets cold. Now, why does that even happen? Because there's no power. Uh, And there is nothing like losing power to realize what having no power is like and how that affects your life. In the same way that that is true physically, it is true spiritually. Now, the difference for the world is that if you never have power to begin with, you can't power on if you don't have any power in the first place. Um. You can live in a house, you can have all the appliances, you can have everything in the world, and you can even go back and flip the big breaker on the back or side of the house to on. But if you are not connected to the power source, all your flipping breakers and doing whatever you're going to do is going to accomplish nothing unless you have a source of power to power on your house. And the same thing is true spiritually. The same thing is true in your relationship with God or not. A few quotes here. Booker T. Washington said, character is power. That's the way he put it. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said, our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. We have guided missiles and misguided men. So something is missing. What is missing? Now, if if you look up quotes, for instance, on power, most of the quotes on power are about misguided power, people that trying to get control, exercise authority over someone else. It's that kind of power. That is not the kind of power I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of power to live your life the way God intended and to accomplish things in his name that he is trying to do in and through you that apart from his power are never going to happen. You can be nice, you can be ethical, you can be moral, you can try to live a a good life, but that is not the same thing as living a godly, holy life that is that is powered by literally the power of God. Um, now, God is described as being omnipotent, all powerful, and I'd like you to turn to Genesis chapter one, and we're going to get you know a glimpse of this pretty quick. Um, you know, we've said this multiple times. You've heard this maybe, maybe not. Whatever you do with the first words, the first four words of the Bible determine your entire worldview. If you allow for the first four words, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God, everything changes. If you discount that, if you disallow that, if there is no God, the Bible says about you, and I'm not being trying to be mean on this, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So if you say, well, the, I'm an atheist, and I'm gonna try to, I, I guess I need to, I think I'm supposed to say this a little gently for some reason, but I don't know how you tell somebody they're a fool gently. You're a fool, right? There's no God. 
so w- what in the world are you thinking? How dark does it get for you to come up with no God? Look around. Look at a baby being born. Look at flowers. Just, just any number of things. Um, and God has manifest his power in creation itself. Just read a few of these verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the macro, the micro, in terms of the, the, the universe itself, the earth being this tiny speck of dust, not even that in the scope of the universe. And then however big it is, he holds it in the span of his hand. You can't, you can't even begin to wrap your head around this kind of God, the power that he has, not only to create a universe, but to hold it together and preserve this tiny little planet. And as far as we know, we're the the only people in the universe. You say, well, I don't believe that. Um, I, I, I believe that there's at least one word in the Bible that would be different if there were people on other planets. And he would have said, not going to all the world. He would have said, going to all the universe. And I would be one of the biggest fundraisers for space exploration you have ever met. Because I would think, I would believe that there were people somewhere on other planets that needed Jesus and we got to go find them. Right? So he's given us a target, the world. And as it turns out, it's pretty daunting by itself. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and then this thing rolls out. He speaks and light everything except for man. God forms man by the dust of the earth, breathes into him Uh, The spirit of life comes to life, and it's power. It's power. And so when I become a Christian, when you became a Christian, and this is very hard to comprehend, I get, because I still don't get this. Um, The same spirit of God that hovered over the face of the deep, that same spirit of God, God himself, when I became a Christian, when I said, okay, God, I can't save myself I believe not just that you are, but you're a rewarder of those that diligently seek you. I am seeking you. You've given me even that desire to seek you. I understand that Jesus died on the cross, was buried, raised from the dead to rescue me. I accept him into my life. I invite you to come live inside of my body, to to not just reside here, but fill me. The same spirit of God that creates the universe now lives in me. Now, you would think that that would change your life. Um, I have a friend, a guy about, I guess, 13, 14 years ago from today uh, became a Christian. And he sent me a text the other day and said, Can, do you have some time to talk? And I called him, and two hours later, he was on fire. Now, if I said his name, most people in the room would know his name because he's been coming here a long time. He said, well, what what had been going on all those years? Things had been brewing. God had been working in his life. And a man in our church came alongside him to disciple him and walk with him. And this guy was in a place to receive that. And all of a sudden, the dots started connecting exponentially. And he was so on fire that now he's trying to figure out a way to reach his family. Right? So he's very frustrated that his brother, he's communicating all these truths to his brother, and his own brother is not responding, and his brother's been a Christian longer than he has, I think. So I said to him, have you ever run a jackhammer? How many of you have run a jackhammer, a big jackhammer, a big one? I'm talking about the, oh, we got some hands that kept going up. Um, and this guy said he had run one. I said, well, ask your brother, let's, let's assume this. You go to your brother's, and your brother has a big jackhammer, and he's trying to break up some concrete. And you see that he is lifting the jackhammer and slamming it on the ground. Lifting the jackhammer, slamming it on the ground, up and down, up and down. And you, you think, okay, something's gone terribly wrong. Why? Because that's not how a jackhammer works. You say, well, how do you explain to someone the change, the power of God that's taken over your life and things are starting to make sense? The way you do that is you show him how the jackhammer is supposed to work. Right? You don't say, what are you, an idiot? Right? Are you an idiot? Dude, that's not how you run a jackhammer. That's, are you stupid? You're an idiot? That's not the answer. You say, wow, that's, that's, a, that's an amazing technique you're using there with the jackhammer. Could I show you maybe just an alternative way to run this jackhammer? 
and you start the jackhammer, crank it up, and its power, boom, 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 boom. Now, you say, well, the guy goes, well, that's, that's witchcraft, right? That's, that's of the devil. That's got to be evil. That's not the way I've always done it. Okay, we'll do it your way, but I'm just telling you, this is how it can run. And then you keep running and breaking up your ground with the power built in the way it's supposed to be and let someone slam it on the ground. Sooner or later, if, now here's the if, if we are running our lives and the power of God is what is at work in our lives, then people observe that and go, okay, enough already, I'm exhausted, what are you doing? What do you got? But if we are the idiots as Christians doing the same stupid thing, then they never ask us. Because we're using the same old technique instead of releasing the power of God in our lives to live our lives. And that is the, it's, it's one of the biggest pieces of bait there is in the universe. A Christian living the Christian life. I, this same guy said the first time that he came here, he, he had been invited to church. He said he walked in the door and just into this room, this specific room years ago, he said he walked in the room and burst into tears. And he said one of the number one indicators was he looked in the eyes of men, specifically in the eyes of men, and he saw life, he saw hope, he saw light, and knew there was, it was going to be okay. So the lights are either on or they're off. The power is either on or it's off. And when it is on, you cannot stop people from seeing that. You say, well, they're not saying anything. They're going to say something sooner or later. That's why the scripture talks about always being ready to give a reason for what? The hope that is within you because sooner or later someone's going to go, how do you have so much hope in the midst of so much despair, so much calamity, so many problems, so much loss, even family members who die, and yet you still have hope? I got a text uh, from one of the ladies in the church. Her sister died, and I don't know how this goes over, but sh I know this woman that died is a believer. So I texted back immediately almost. I said, I am so sorry, and I'm sorry for her because I know there is pain, there's grieving. But immediately after that, I said, but I am so excited for your sister because she's seen the king. She's seen the king. It doesn't get any better than that. You say, well, she died. No, but she's alive, more alive than ever. And that's the hope that I have. That's the hope that we have. And that gives you power like you cannot believe. Because no matter what comes against you, you say, well, what if I die? I die. And, uh, and I live forever with him. I know I will see him just like that, quicker than that. I will be in his presence. And that should take your breath away by itself. What if some other problem comes? Greater is he who is in me, inside of me, than he who's in the world. Certainly there's someone in the world, but that, that being in the world is not greater than the being in me. Because the God that lives in me as a believer created the whole universe. Omnipower. Omnipotent. Omnipotent. And that's... Now you say, well then why don't you live a sinless life, a perfect life? That's a really good question. What is wrong with me? How can I have that God, that power, that access literally inside of this human body and that not change everything, everything? First Chronicles chapter 29. <clears throat> This may end up being like Lawrence of Arabia where we take like a 15-minute intermission and come back. So if you've ever seen that movie, this could take a minute. First Chronicles 29. Now this is why, again, it is so important to read the Scriptures. If you read the paper, they're usually not good news. If you watch the news, it's usually not good news. No one wants to hear that. You want to read something that will change your life? Read the scriptures. 
right? Let that be the thing that flows through your brain, through your heart, through your soul, your spirit. Be, let that be the thing. Let that be the thing that renews your mind. You say, I got all this junk in my head. Then renew it. Get the old out, get the new in. And it'll change the way you think and live. First Chronicles 29, 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom of the Lord. And you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you. And you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now why would I go anywhere else if that's what I need? I need strength, I need power, I need might, I need God to move in my life. Then why do we go everywhere but him? And why is it it takes us so long to get to the place where we say, Lord, I don't want it if it's not of you, and if you don't do it, it isn't gonna happen. Because if I can do it by myself, I don't need you, and I need you. And so God brings along challenges, situations in our lives and in the lives of other people around us. And, and you say, well, my goodness, this, there's no way this is going to work out. Why do you think you pray for people to be healed? Because the doctors have run all their traps, and I'm not saying anything wrong with doctors. But there's a point at which no one can do anything but God. You say, well, I prayed and the person died. you got to be okay with that too. But don't stop asking. Now, by the way, just kind of really parenthetically here, a bunch of this stuff I'm telling you, I don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Right? And anybody tells you they do, be careful. Why am I even asking God for stuff that he can do whether I ask him or not? Why am I praying my guts out for someone to be healed, not die, and they die? I don't get all that. Right? Right? Now, if anybody here says, oh, I get it, then we have counselors standing by. You know, you, know, you can't get your head around that. What I do know is he said to ask, and I don't, get to, I don't get to come up with his answers, but I do get to ask. And part of the asking is, is relationship and communication with him. And sometimes the asking is what gives you the ability to hold on. Because if you got nowhere to go, you're in trouble. When your wife's in the hospital and you're not sure whether she's going to come out the front door or the back door, and you are trying to figure out how to hold on, you better grab you some hand that will never let you go or it ain't going to go well. Because when you lose hope, things go very poorly. I have been in a place in my life before where I lost hope. I did not want to die. I really want to die. I just could not figure out how to live. And so I thought the answer was just to die because I was so overwhelmed and so distraught that I could not make it work. And God sent me help, and I'm still grateful to this day. You better have someone to talk to that can talk you through it and you say, well, but I didn't get the answer I wanted. He says, but you got my answer, and you got to be okay with that because I've got a reason. And I say, yes, sir, thank you, sir. Or I could get bitter, I could get angry, and he's used to that too. He's got millennia of experience with people flipping him off, calling him names, and, you know, ditching him. But eventually you'll figure out you got nowhere else to go. And you circle back around and say, hey, I'm back. I've come to myself, and I'm back. Because there's no, no one, even if he didn't answer your prayer the way you want it answered, no one ever cared for you like Jesus. No one. No one. Even when I get a no to my prayer, it's better to get a no from him than a yes if it's not his will. And you got to trust him. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. And I'm going to read you this whole chapter, but I do recommend reading this whole chapter. Go back, talking about God. Go down to verse 25. And he's writing through Isaiah about himself, God about himself. To whom then will you liken me? Okay, who are you going to compare me to? 
Or to whom shall I be equal? You're going to tell me that I'm down here equal to something or someone. Says the Holy One, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number? Talking about the stars. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? So God doesn't see me and what's going on with me, and what I've brought to him and and, and taken before him, my just claim, what I say you should do, God, has been passed over. He's not paying attention to me, which all these things are rhetorical. there's There's no truth to this. Then verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And you think, well, that's a category they never run out. I got kids, but I got friends that got little boys, and they tell me it's either on or off. One guy told me literally his little boys running nonstop, and they will literally be running down a hallway and fall asleep running and just collapse in the floor and fall asleep. And they put them in bed, and they wake up and take off again. But even a youth runs out of power and collapses because they're tired. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. So you say, God, I can't take any more. I can't do this anymore. I can't take the pressure. And I think women have a whole other set of stuff. Um, But sometimes as a man, you say, okay, I'm supposed to be a godly man. And then you're going to throw, I'm supposed to be a godly husband. And now I'm supposed to be a godly father. And now I'm supposed to be a godly pastor. And now I'm supposed to be a godly friend. And now I'm supposed to be a godly something else. Come up with something else. You can't pile all that. I can't do all that. I can't be all that. And some men snap, and they go buy a convertible and go to California. They used to. Nobody wants to go there anymore. But anyhow, um, they're heading to Florida. It's a new place. Um, Can't take it anymore. You say, well, how does that happen? They give up too quick. Because even if that's where you are, you take a deep breath and say, Lord, I can't do this anymore. And what would he say to you? Wait. Don't do anything rash. Wait, because what happens when you wait on the Lord? They shall renew their strength. And all of a sudden you can breathe again. You say, okay, I can do this. Um, happy hours are very interesting things. If you really, I, I'm, not, I'm no expert on happy hours. I don't drink, never been drunk, don't, I don't know anything about it. But I do kind of get happy hours. What's a happy hour about? It's a period of time between work and work. Right, And so the world has created this little happy hour. I'm going to be happy for an hour. I'm going to blow in here, and I'm going to drink some some medicine. And I'm going to try to decompress before I go back into that next crazy place. And you say, well, but it works for some people. Uh, I, I am more interested in a happy day than a happy hour. Right? I'm trying to figure out how to have a happy day. And there's a way to do that without medicating. Um, I have pulled off the road before and stopped. Right? Any man ever done that? Any woman ever done that? I'm not going drinking, but I can't re-enter. For a long time there, I had an estrogen meter on the house. Um, and if I pulled up to the house, four women, and that little red light was going, I just drove. I just kept driving. <laughs> I'd come back by and look, and still levels were too high. 
And then that light would go off and I'd go in prayerfully. So, you didn't know there was such a thing as an estrogen meter. They also make thermostats with a menopause setting where the air comes on and it goes off. It comes on. Yeah, that, that's not in here anywhere. That's just the Lord led me to share all that with you. So, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Now you say, oh, I've never gotten any wings and flown. The Lord get a hold of you, you feel like you're flying. And what do wings do? It doesn't matter what's in front of them. They fly over it. Mount up, wings like eagles, and they soar. So that wind that's going to knock you down makes an eagle rise. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, that's either possible or it's not. It's only possible if you look to him and you wait on him. And you focus on him. You don't sit around thinking about, oh, what I can't do. I don't, I, me, 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 me. I can't. I'm tired. All these things. At some point you have to stop and say, Lord, it's not about what I am or what I'm not. I am not alone. I have you living inside me. Go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And I get some of you know it by heart. I am trying to get us to know these things by life, not by heart. So Jesus is going to leave the planet, and he promises he's not leaving us. In other passages, comfortless, not leaving us alone. And Acts 1, 8 says this, but you shall receive power. So, you have Jesus on the planet, and clearly he is God, man, man, God, the manifest presence of God in physical form. So, he has power. He looks at a dead person and speaks, they get up. He touches a lame man or just thinks about it, and boom, power. That's, it's un unbelievable power. That's who he is. Calms a storm, power. Um, and he says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, you say, okay, well, so did I get power when I became a Christian? Yes. Are you aware of the power? Maybe not any more than my buddy's friend I talked to you about the jackhammer. Someone gives you a jackhammer and says, you can break up soil with this tool. But they never explain to you how to turn the device on. And so you do your best. Now listen closely out there and here. This is why discipleship is so huge. You cannot just hand someone the operator, the owner's manual and say, well, they're just stupid because they didn't figure it out. Even, even a, a simple job, there is some training somewhere to say, here's how you do the job. Big corporations have corporate People that take on a new employee and mentor them, take them along, show them the ropes so that the company will survive after they're gone. The older people are gone. So why does the church not figure this out? You have to come alongside someone and say, look, this is how the dots connect. Here's how it works. Or you have poor Christians out there just banging the ground like everybody else. So he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And an indicator of that power that it has happened to you is what? And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. So when that power kicks in, it, it causes us to be witnesses to the fact and the power of God, what he's done. So what is my explanation for how my, wife, my life has worked to this point? I have no explanation but him. I would not be alive without him. I was thinking about taking my life. So the only reason I'm alive is he has sustained me. He's protected me. Everything that I have, everything that I can do, I cannot do. Without him, the scripture says you can do nothing. You can't wake yourself up in the morning. You can't keep yourself alive. You, you, can't, you, can't, you don't control anything. So it's all him. So when that power is unleashed in me, then I'm a witness to that's who is, is running my life. You say, well, people don't want to hear that. They don't believe that. That's not my problem. 
I'm going to run my jackhammer the way it's supposed to be run, and you decide if you want to run yours the old way. I got uh, two other people I can think of. Um, one of them, a tornado hit his house, his neighborhood. Um, and I'm talking about a swath of blocks, blocks and blocks of homes in the dark, trees in their roof. He had a tree in his roof too. And I finally made my way to his house. And the only house on the whole block for blocks and blocks and blocks that all the lights were on. Now you talk about upsetting your neighbors. Somehow, miraculously, he did not lose power. Do you know why? He had a generator. A natural gas generator that the second he lost power, he lost no power because the generator kicked in and everything stayed the same. I have a built-in generator. And when I lose power, I never lose power. You got you a generator? A lot of people wanting to buy one about now. A lot of people the pool's about to own a generator. So when I became a Christian, I received a power generation person. Person. And I run out of power, and he says, I got you. In fact, when you thought you had you, I had you anyway. Because you didn't even have you when you thought you had you. It's all me. I got this. Back to my friend with the generator. He had lights. Before you know it, he set up a little station, a charging station for neighbors, their cell phones, coffee pots. Now they're benefiting from his source of power. Is that your life? Are you set up to not just generate for yourself, but to say, Lord, use me? Because there are people with no power. They're not going to make it. They are literally in absolute darkness. Acts chapter 3. Um, so Peter, a guy's gotten healed, and Peter's been used in the healing of this guy. Acts chapter 3, verse 12. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at, at this? Like, what are you so surprised about? Or why look so intently at us? Like, why are you looking at us as though by our own, by our own power or godliness, we had, we had made this man walk? So you're assuming that because we have some power of our own and because we are godly, look at that. We are godly, so we are godly or we have our own built-in personal power that that's why this guy walked. And here's the explanation. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. That same guy. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. It's always nice to have your past brought up. And what did you do? Killed the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And it's interesting, the power kicks in, and now they are that. They are witnesses to what happened, what he's doing, who he is. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given us, him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. It is not faith in a person, unless that person is Jesus. Be very careful following people more closely than you follow Jesus. There are 
seemingly great godly men who we discover have tremendous challenges and people get so caught up. And I have even been pulled in a little bit because I can think of one and I'm not even going to say the man's name. But I would watch this man preach and I would go, I will never be that man. Such power, such authority, such impact. I'm thinking, wow. And as it turns out, the guy's living this totally double life. Now here's where the danger is. You say, well, I'm out. No, he's out. You don't have to be out because somebody's a fool. Right? Who are you following? Never get more caught up in following the person who is pointing you to Jesus Don't get distracted by the person and go, wow, I'm just going to follow you. All of John the Baptist's followers, if they knew what they were doing, ended up following Jesus. They didn't keep following John the Baptist. John the Baptist came to point to Jesus. So you say, well, this person led me to the Lord. I get get that. But let's stay with the Lord and don't get caught up in that person. Because it's not that person's power. It's not that person's godliness even, suppose it or not. It's the power of God. It's faith in the name. Romans 1, 16. Um, You know what? Let me just go ahead and say this out loud before we read this. I am not all that you think I am. Let's just get that on the table. A man told me when I was 14 years old, and I wrote this in the Bible that I had then, God help me be who other people think I am. He said, what are you saying? You follow me around closely long enough, you're going to find cracks in the pot. I am not sinless perfection. Do not follow me. Follow who I point you to. And you say, well, what is he talking about? I'm talking about the same thing you'd get up here and say because you're not perfect either. We all got troubles. We all got challenges. And they're not going to go away until we drop dead and see Jesus. But you can at least minimize the chaos by taking responsibility for your challenges, having some accountability, and trying to say, Lord, help me, not just, oh, well, this is who I am and I'm just going to die this way. That is a powerless approach to, to sin and temptation. Okay, so some of you think, well, it's too, you know, you're keeping it too real. We want to think of you as this. Do not think of me as anything. Think of him. You can have an expectation of some kind, but do not get caught up in a person. Okay, Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why is he not ashamed? For it is the power. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So you can't be ashamed of it. Well, I'm just embarrassed to say this out loud. If you don't spit it out, there is no power unleashed. And I've told these stories repeatedly. I shared with a group yesterday even. I have gotten on an elevator, an elevator going up so many floors. I get on the elevator and the Holy Spirit will will say something like this. Share the gospel to that person right now. Total stranger on an elevator. I don't know how many seconds we got left on the elevator. And I've looked at a person and I say, this may be the strangest thing that's ever happened to you, but I believe I'm supposed to tell you that God loves you, that Jesus died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead for you. Boom, doors open, you get off, and it's over. You say, well, what in the world could happen there? That is the power of God into salvation. You plant that seed. How long does it take to run in your neighbor's yard and shove a watermelon seed in the middle of their beautiful lawn? Not giving anybody any ideas, but it is kind of fun to watch what happens. You say, well, that, nothing's going to happen with that. Oh, just watch. One little seed in the right dirt Kaboom, power. That seed germinates and here they come. Jack and the beanstalk. 
between the Old and the New Testament, that story. Um, if you're looking for a verse, Patrick. You know, why do we love stories like that? These magic little beans. And look, boom, plant a seed and kaboom, this thing, this, this vine that goes to the heavens. I got, I got the gospel. I got the gospel. And all I got to do is say the seed. Say the seed. Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and raised from the dead. And if someone hears that and that's all they hear, they can be saved. You say, well, how's that possible? It's the power of God and salvation. That is the gospel. So all these people say, well, I can't be a witness. I don't have all the answers. You got the seed. Say the seed. Well, I can't say the seed. Why can't you say the seed? I'm embarrassed. No, you might be ashamed. Why would you be ashamed of the gospel? The only reason I can come up for being ashamed of the gospel is I'm about to spit out something that don't look like what I'm doing. Right? Why would I be ashamed? It's the same reason why little kids say at a certain age to their parents, Hey, Mom, you can just drop me off here a mile from school. I'll walk the rest of the way. Has a parent ever heard anything remotely close to this? Raise your hand if you've heard this. Mom, drop me off. You don't have to take me all the way to the front door. Right? Why? They're ashamed of their goofball parents. And so we don't want to be associated. If you're not ashamed, you will share. Because someone else's life's at stake. How about 2 Corinthians? I got all kind of verses. It's a great book. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So this is a really interesting one. You're not going to like this one necessarily. Um, there are things in the Bible that come in threes. It's a really kind of fascinating deal. I'm not saying it always has to be this way. Jesus in the garden, what? He prayed three times. If it's possible, let this cup pass for me, but not my will, your will be done. Comes back, checks his buddies are asleep, goes back again. Makes a run at his dad again. Hey, how about, goes back, comes back, third time, okay. Similar thing with Paul. He's being see, seeing so many extraordinary spiritual things. Revelations are coming to him so fast and hard 2 Corinthians 12, 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Literally, look at what this thorn is described as. A messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now that's intense. A messenger of Satan sent to keep him in check lest he be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, so he realizes, I've, I'm coming up against something, a messenger of Satan, some kind of thorn in his physical flesh. And so he pleads with the Lord three times that it might depart. He's like, okay, three times, I'll make a run at it. Jesus made a run at you three times, I'll make a run three times. That this thing would go away, depart from me. And what answer did he get? He got a no but even something better than what he had asked for. Because the answer comes back, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, so he's, he runs that trap and says, okay, so it's not going away, but the reason that it's here is that his grace is made perfect in weakness, so this weakness, this area of my life that I see as weakness is going to be used to make me perfect in terms of strength. 
Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, how does that work? It seems totally backwards. Why don't you just make me strong and then I'm strong when I'm strong? Because we tend to wander off when we're strong. Oh, I feel better. Think about it. Somebody gets sick. Oh, you're on your knees in the closet somewhere. Oh, God. Oh, God. Please be merciful. Heal them, heal them, heal them. They come out the front door. Whoo! Glad that's over. What were we doing before? Where's all that closet time? Where's all that begging and pleading and crying out to God? And, oh, have mercy. I don't need mercy. The sun came out. Power's on. We're back. And so God somehow builds into the system weakness. These things that keep thorning us, sticking us, and cause us to say, I can't do this without you. He says, you're right. So you'll know when you've, ex- you've kind of settled in on his answer because then you're not just going, okay, right, okay, whatever you, I'll do it your way then, right? No, that's not what this is. This thing switched to, I will gladly boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may dwell in me. And not just that, take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, distress, for when I'm weak, I'm strong. So what's your problem? Come up with the worst thing you can come up with. I'll tell you what happened in my house. Those lights were off for 50 hours and we're you know, dressed like we're going snow skiing just to go to the bathroom. You know, you're just like, what in the world? I'll tell you one of the things that happened in my house. I'm walking around praising God for electricity. What in the world? I got a house. I got, I got a, you know, it wasn't seven degrees in my house. You just start thinking about things you didn't, you didn't think about, right? So it causes you, if it's working, or you can walk around, well, this sucks, and this ain't right, and my neighbor, and I, oh, I made some calls. I sat in my car one night for two hours on hold with a place called Encore. I was very nice, though, believe it or not. I was very nice. Lady finally answered the phone, was very kind, and I said, ma'am, I'm sitting here in my car, and across the street on all sides, the lights are on. I see light right there. Why they got power, I don't have any power. That's what the world's supposed to be looking at us the same way. Not lording it over them going, na 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 na, we got power, you're going to hell, na 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 na. Right? That's not how it works. My neighbor, also who had no power, the guy right next to me, went and bought a generator, and he finally gave up and left, and he said, you can use my generator. So what is your infirmity? What is your distress? What is your reproach? What is your need? And you'll hear me pray this along the way because this is something I saw in Scripture, somebody showed me. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do not jerk that verse out of its context because the context of that verse is I've learned to abound and to be abased. And what he's talking about is contentment. So if you have food and clothing, the Bible says that's what he promised. You've got to find a way to be content with that. Is it okay to say it'd be nice to have more? Yes. But until you get to the place where you can say, Lord, I thank you, I praise you, I trust you. I have learned to be abased, to have only what you promised, food and clothing. I promise you in this country, you can pretty quick jump a little off of food and clothing. A few more things. Another one on the regard to the gospel, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. <clears throat> A few more and we're done. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. 
For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Never leave the cross out. Jesus died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead. There's power in the cross. There's power in the blood. We sing songs about it. Why? Because it's true. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Why? Because that blood was shed and presented before the Father and our sins are atoned for and we're home. Power. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Let me read you some of these out of Ephesians, and we're close. Uh, this one's kind of fun, actually. Uh, I don't give you a lot of Greek words because I don't think people really care about that. <clears throat> but maybe you do, so I'll give you a few. Ephesians 1.15, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. So what is he after? You've got to know what the hope of his calling is and what are the riches of of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. You are dealing with a God who can literally raise someone from the dead. You got no problems. And that power, that person lives in me. One commentary put it this way in regard to this passage. The Apostle Paul gives us a glimpse of the power of God when he writes of, quote, his incomparable great power for us who believe or, or his exceeding greatness. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above the rule and authority. The Greek word translated great is megathos, which means strong or great. And it appears only here in the New Testament. This word obviously wasn't sufficient for Paul to express God's great power, so he adds the word incomparably, or in Greek, hyperbolon, related to a verb that literally means to throw beyond the usual mark or to, quote, excel or surpass. So the full idea of the expression hyperbolon megathos is that of power beyond measure, a superabounding or, su or surpassing power, power that is, quote, more than enough. So you say, well, God just gave me just barely enough. No, you can't come up with that. He wants us to know that his exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the work of his mighty power. It is beyond. You, you throw a javelin and somebody show up and throws it a mile past you. You go, what is that? Exceeding. Exceedingly great. So that's the God you're dealing with. That's the kind of power you're dealing with. You say, I can't live the Christian life. It's a lie. It's a lie. You say, well, I don't know how to live the Christian life. I'm a Christian. I know I'm a Christian, so that I must have power. Yeah, but do you know how to, to work the power? Do you know how to ask God to unleash that power in your life over sin, over fear, over whatever it is you have? She says, I don't know how to do that. Well, get some help. If you're ignorant, you just don't know. If you're ignorant and you don't ask for help, I'm telling you as gently as I can, that's stupid. That's stupid. Two-year-olds say, I can do it by myself. You can't be a two-year-old the rest of your life. There's maybe a time for that spiritually even. But at some point you go, I can't do this. I don't know what I'm doing. I was so desperate, wanted to die I was so desperate, that when God sent me help, I, just, I was like, okay, let's go. I didn't care who the guy was almost. If you got help, help. I'm listening, show me, because I've tried it my way. I am helpless. I feel powerless, even though you're going to tell me I do have power to live this life. I don't know how. Help me know how. And how many Christians walking around with no power manifest in their life, ashamed a little bit because they can't even make it work for them. Why am I going to tell you to give your life to Jesus when I did it and I can't even make it work? 
Well, you'll get a ticket to heaven too. Yeah, but I'm embarrassed that I can't make the rest of it work. Show me, help me. That's why the mission statement of this church is disciples making disciples. Let someone help you. Send an email, write, say, look, it's not working. I, can, I take on as many as I can, I, you know, but we got people here that will take you on. And it'll change your life because that's the, the mechanism that he left in place. Discipleship. It's just spiritually raising kids. So they're not by themselves. <sighs> Ephesians 3. Let me read through. Just, I don't want to leave these out, so let's do them quick. Um, now nah, i leave that one out. Go to Ephesians 3, 14. No, we're going to do 14. Another way he describes this thing, uh, Ephesians 3, 14. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So how does this work? Your strength is might through his spirit in the inner man. It is not me being stronger. I am weak. It is him being strong in me. Okay? So you unleash him to be your strength. You are the strength of my life. We sing these songs. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church of, of Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen able to do exceedingly abundantly. If you are barely just crawling along and oh, if I can just make it to the pearly gates, it's all going to be okay. Like, what are you doing? I'm just hanging on, waiting for Jesus to get me. you got no verses for that. That can happen. That's not what he intended. It is possible to have thorns in the flesh and be stronger than you ever could have been without them. And whatever the distress, infirmity, need, whatever it is, you say, Lord, I don't care, whatever you allow, you would not allow this with one of your children unless it was to benefit your child. So I trust you. So what are we doing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take pleasure in this then. There's something good. It's the two little twin boys. One had a terrible attitude. The other one had a great attitude. In one room, there's all pleasants piled everywhere. And he says, I don't like any of this. And, and the other kid's got a pile of horse manure in his room. And he's running around in circles around the pile of horse manure. And he's all excited. And they said, son, why are you excited? There's got to be a pony somewhere. <laughs> this is all how you look at it. You say, well, God just put a pile of manure in my life. No, he hasn't. There's got to be a pony somewhere. He's not just jacking with you. Oh, let's see. We haven't hit Dallas recently. Let's just go down there and mess them up. Right? Oh, that'll be fun. He'll poke him. Oh, let's just kill that one. Boom, like a bug. He's not up there doing that. It cost him his son to come after us. So if, if he allows something in your life, it's for a very surgical, specific reason. Pay attention. Praise him anyway. Trust him and say, okay, Lord, what are you doing? What is, if this was the only thing that, that you could allow to get my attention, you got my attention. Let's get this over with and get on with it. And if you don't remove it, and that's how I'm going to be strong, I want to be strong in the power of your might. Just do one more. 2 Timothy 1, 7. And then you got to go read 1 Peter and 2 Peter by yourself and see if you can find the verses I was going to read. 2 Timothy. A lot of people know this one, but if you don't, this is good. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. And it describes it literally as a spirit of fear. So, woo, what are you going to do? What's going to happen? Woo, fear, 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 fear. So the devil comes along and says, hey, how about some fear? You go, oh, yes, I love fear because then I can stay here and that's my excuse for not getting along with my wife. And then God comes along and says, well, I got a three to one ratio here. He's offering fear, but today... Our special is power, love, sound mind. Would you like some of that? 
Oh, no, I'll keep my fear because if I go with power, love, and sound mind, I'll have to live a life. I'll have to get out of this depression, this hole that I've dug. To, woe is me. So he says, here's power. Here's love. Here's a sound mind. You can think the way you're supposed to think. And then goes right into verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. Back to the power. So my phone is now on, right? It's on. But I've got this little trick thing here. I can push that button one more time. And guess what it says on the top of my phone? Slide to power off. So let me tell you something about having power. You can't power on in your life. You can't power through any situations unless you've got the power on. And you can't have the power on unless you've got the power in. And you can't get the power in unless you do it God's way, and that's Jesus. So my, my power-generating person, God himself living in me, he would not kick the door of my heart down. He's not going to impose himself on me. He gives me faith. He gives me the universe. He reveals who he is, and he says, are you in? And are you in for me being in? And you got to come up with an answer. And I was confronted with that question many years ago, and I said, I'm in. I want you in. I want the power in. I don't want to just have power around me. I need power in me or I'm in the dark and I cannot live the way I'm supposed to live. So you say, well, how do I get the power in? You say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I've screwed up. I'm the reason you came. I'm one of the reasons. I believe that you sent your son Jesus. He died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead to offer me the forgiveness of my sin and eternal life, all of us are a gift. And so I'm saying thank you, I accept. Come live in me. And as you've heard me say repeatedly, people say it can't be that easy. And I say easy for who? Easy for you, because all you've got to do is accept it. Not so easy for him. It cost the father his son. It cost the son his life to make it that simple. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are and what is possible and that we know it as Christians when it's working the way it's supposed to be working because when the power is on, we can power on. And even though we have a source of power, we can power off and try to do it in the flesh and it doesn't go well. So anyone today, Lord, who is not a Christian yet and they know that they are living in the dark. It is cold. It is miserable. It is empty. There is no hope. There is no future. They have no answer for eternity. They have no answer for death. And really no answer for life and their own sin and guilt and fear and shame and all that's piled up on them. And today they would say, Father, I yield. I get it. Thank you for depositing the seed of the gospel in my heart and mind. And that I feel it ger germinating as it were now. I am a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I do believe that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood to pay for my sin personally. I accept the forgiveness of my sins, this gift of eternal life. Come live in me right now and be the, the power-generating person that I have been missing in my life, not just to get, you, get me through my life, but through my death and into eternity with you. Thank you for loving me, for being patient, and for sending so many seed speakers, as it were, people who deposited into my life. And now that that's, that's come to fruition, and I've responded, and thank you even for the faith to give me the faith to believe. It's all you. And Father, for Christians, it's not that you don't live in them. They have powered off and are trying to do this in the flesh and just need to say, Lord, I need to know how to power on, power up, power through what you intended. And if I need somebody to come alongside me and help me, then, then send that person or show me who that person is to ask and help me be willing to submit to someone's leadership in my life to help me make it. 
Thank you, God, for loving us, for being patient with us, for being so kind, so merciful, so long-suffering, but also so powerful. And we see that manifest in our lives, and we pray that we would see that manifest more in us individually and collectively as a church, and a church universal, the body of Christ on this planet, that we could see people turn to you by the millions, by the billions, even so, Lord. Um, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm not sure who that was, but obviously a child thrilled that it is over. So, All right, so whether you're in the room or beyond, first thing, um, if you prayed a simple prayer, and it's simple but powerful, amen, okay. And when this all is over, we'll have a nursery. So, um, but I don't, I don't think I'm going to want that because I like having them in here. If you prayed that simple prayer and you know something's happened, just it, it's so encouraging to us. Just send us an email, call the office, just say, look, I was watching, I was listening, and I heard it, I got it, and I know God lives in me now. I could use some help some encouragement, somebody to walk with me, and we're game for trying to facilitate that. But let us know. Just send an email to reunion at reunionchurch.org, and uh, we'll look forward to it. We hear from a bunch of people and look forward to hearing from you too. Uh, or in the room, same thing. Um, send us an email, or there's plenty of people, maybe somebody you came with or you know that would be willing to help and encourage you if you've prayed that and you know something changed. That's the biggest decision a person ever makes in their life to follow Christ. Um, we also, one day, will take an offering with baskets. It's an old school thing they used to do years ago. Um, but till we get back to that, we got some red boxes on the way out. You can put an offering there or you can go to reunionchurch.org and there's a little give tab. Uh, and we are working now on cryptocurrency. I said we were going to work on that. So crypto, sounds like death something, but anyhow. Um, Thank you, Kenny. You are on it today. Yeah. So um, we, uh, you know, that's, that's how you can give as well. We appreciate everybody's faithfulness uh, to him primarily, and we benefit as a church from that. Okay. So good to see you guys here and how, whoever's watching out there. Great that you could join us. But I'm telling you, there is nothing like in person. I promise you. And we, you know, we got ways... You can stiff arm somebody if they try to hug you. It's all options, right? Do the Heisman or something on them and keep them away. But um, we're trying to be careful, but we're also trying to be careful not to get so isolated that we don't live the way God intended. So love you guys, love you guys, love having you here, and look forward to seeing you as you feel comfortable coming back. All right, let's stand up. We're going to sing our way out of here. God bless you all. Uh, have a tremendous day, and look forward to seeing you soon.